Amber Clay um, is the co-author of The Hidden Half of Nature, and uh, which, when I stumbled on it, was an enormously inspiring book. And with her partner, Dave Montgomery, who's also written uh, Dirt and uh, Growing a Revolution. And they're now working on another book, which is about the connection between soil health and human health, which is enormously important. Um, she's a great speaker and a great writer. So, Amber Clay. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dave. <clears throat> okay, let's see if I can get these gadgets figured out here. <clears throat> okay, I am delighted to be here at the Real Organic Project. And when uh, Dave and Lindley contacted me and invited me to speak, Lindley said, you must have a big idea. So I thought, oh God, the pressure is on. Um, here we go. And this is my big idea. Soil health is our health. And I don't think anyone in this room would find this too surprising. And while I say it's my big idea, what I really want to tell you is I am remembering a big idea. This idea goes back 25 centuries at least. Um, Hippocrates wrote a treatise called Airs, Waters, and Places. And in that piece, he intuited, he thought that if you really want to know about the health of somebody, you need to know about the air they breathe, the water they drink, and the place they live. And place is about land, and place is about soil, I would contend. And to me, when I thought about this, I thought, wow, I think he was talking about terroir, terroir of the human body. And what I like about the Real Organic Project is that we're bringing these notions uh, back into you know, what started a long time ago as organic farming. So I think this is a really um, important concept. And let's fast forward 24 centuries to one of my personal heroines, Lady Eve Balfour, an English agronomist and farmer. And in the run-up to World War II, she wrote this book called The Living Soil. And if you have not read this, your action item after this event, I insist that you go get this book so that you can read it. And part of the reason for that is I love this subtitle. She lays it out for us, Evidence of the Importance to Human Health of Soil Vitality. And what uh, Balfour and her peers, which included a number of other farmers and doctors as well, they had a hypothesis, and it went like this. Poor soil health leads to poor health in crops and animals, and this ripples right on through to the people that eat those things. And what we have here is, in addition to a classic ripple effect, this is how infections and epidemics spread. It starts in one place with one thing, and it goes on from there. And so I think that's an important concept to, to sort of um, remember and think about. And let's fast forward a little bit more. This is information from British nutritionists that covers a 50-year period, roughly from about 1940 to 1990. And there on the right side of the slide, you can read that. Those are declines across a number of different vegetable crops that these, nutrition, these nutritionists documented. And they also documented declines in iron by about 50% in beef. And so this is, um, this is alarming and this is concerning. And what the ancients <clears throat> intuited and what Balfour and her peers surmised, we know today through this infographic is something that we somehow keep seem, seeming to forget, and that is that the source of the minerals that end up in our food that come into our bodies, that source is the rocky bones of our planet. As these rocks are weathered and decompose, the minerals weather out and they end up in the soil. Into the plants they go, and from there, into our bodies. And 
This is even more recent. This is from 2017. And I've highlighted the part here. Vitamins, phenolics, and antioxidants are higher in organically produced fruits. Now, what you need to know is that we sometimes lump nutrition all together in a big ball. And we just say, good nutrition, proper nutrition. These types of nutrients are not like calories that fuel our growth from an infant into an adult. These are the kinds of nutrients, here is your translation, that are frontline prevention for many chronic diseases that um, afflict us in the modern age. So if organic farming is resulting in higher levels of these disease-preventing nutrients, what does that mean about uh, conventional farming? What does that mean about everything that you've heard this morning with regard to the National Organic Program and what has happened? All right, so your takeaway here is that I think nutrient-dense food grown in healthy soils, this is the real health plan that we all need to begin talking about. And this is what's at stake with the efforts of the Real Organic Project and anybody with an interest in these linkages between food and farming and health. All right, the second leg of the big idea concerns the green body of a plant. And I wanna take you to a wild and alive place that the roots of a plant inhibit or inhabit, and that is the rhizosphere. This rhizosphere, this is a halo-like area that you can draw an outline around every root and root hair of a plant. About a nanometer, maybe a, a couple mil millimeters out, you will find this rhizosphere. And what happens in the rhizosphere is nothing short of spectacular and amazing and awe-inspiring. The rhizosphere is where most of the plant my microbiome resides. It's not up in the leaves or the fruits or the stems. It is down here in the rhizosphere. And what we know about the rhizosphere is that it is, it is a give and a get world. It is one of the grandest symbioses that we have on this planet. And what plants are giving, they kick it off with these things called exudates. And these exudates are oozing and flowing out of a plant's roots. And what kinds of things are in those exudates. It's cocktails of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, various types of signaling compounds and molecules. And there at the doorstep of the rhizosphere is the, the root microbiome. These are communities of microorganisms. Lindley put her finger on it this morning when she said, we know, we know only maybe around 1% of soil microorganisms, and yet, this is a big, big part of a plant's green body. And so really what these exudates are, they are a uh, pop-up restaurant in the soil. These are meals for microbes ready to go. And what do microbes do in return? They're giving some, they're, 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 they're getting these exudates and they're giving back metabolites. And so what might a well-fed root microbiome be able to do for the green body of a plant? A few things. Here we've got some fetching fungi, and they are prospecting out in the mineral part of soil for phosphorus. That's the P of NPK, an essential plant nutrient. The plant has farmed this job out to certain kinds of fungi. What else can a well-fed root microbiome do? it can stimulate the plant immune system to produce defensive compounds to send this insect herbivore packing off to some unhealthy plant. All right? And what is the, I would say, almost the, the, the sort of the overarching thing about the root microbiome is this. It also just engages in ceaseless, ceaseless conversations and chatter with its plant host about what kinds of things, all kinds of things. Who's friend, who's foe, what's going on with moisture levels, what's going on with temperature levels. Oh, what about that neighboring plant over there? Does it have something I need? Do I have something it needs? So the root microbiome is absolutely an integral part of a plant's green body 
and it is a part of the soil also at the same time. And so what does that mean? The brain of a plant is not on top of the body like where our brain is. It is in the subterranean world. It is in the rhizosphere. And that can mean only one thing, my friends. This is plant intelligence in every sense of that word, all right? And there it is, out of sight, beneath our feet, and we hardly even know about it. So this is kind of extraordinary. It is the key. It is, it is the key to uh, a way of farming and a way of agriculture that we really need to be moving toward. Does brain food matter for the botanical world? Okay, if you're falling asleep, wake up, wake up. There's a little quiz here. There's three treatments. There's a conventional treatment, <clears throat> composted manure, and nothing. Okay, look at this. So here we go. Conventional, the big problem with conventional forms of agriculture is that they completely scramble the root microbiome. The intelligence that a plant has honed over millennia just gets perverted and messed up. And you end up with a paltry anemic root system like the one in the middle, and that is producing hardly any exudates, and you get into this vicious negative feedback of hardly anything in the way of microbial life. And you then end up rushing in and replacing all of this stuff with various kinds of agrochemicals. So we often hear we are what we eat. That is not really true. We are all, our crops, our animals, and us, we are what the soil microbiome eats. And this is a really different way of thinking about diet, food, and soils. And so I think your takeaway here really is that over the long run, we've been at this thing called agriculture for a little over 10,000 years, and it needs to keep going if we are going to stay alive and inhabit this planet. And over the long run, there is no amount of agrochemicals that is ever going to be able to do everything that a robust and well-nourished and well-fed root microbiome is going to be able to do. And that is one of the biggest problems with the direction of the National Organics Program. They have forgotten this. And that is an issue that I hope um, you're gonna, you, you've heard it this morning, you've heard it from me, I hope we hear it again this afternoon. Okay, on to the third leg of the big idea, seven of 10. This is the number of adults in America that die prematurely um, due to preventable causes. So let's unpack that. These are the top five causes of early death among, um, among Americans. And those top two, certain kinds of cancer and heart disease are diet-related ailments. So this is what is killing most of us is diet-related ailments. I think that's alarming. This is wrecking people's lives. It's dominating our economy. It's swinging us in a direction that we don't need to go. And I think we can turn this around, though. I think we can, we can take this hypothesis of Balfour and her peers, and I think soil health and the soil is a key factor in turning this around. And Dave mentioned this book, and it's the story we tell in The Hidden Half of Nature. How do we get the health of the soil and the health of our bodies turned around? And my firsthand experience with this started in our side yard here. Now, I am not a farmer, but I do have a bad case of plant lust. I am somewhat enamored with the botanical world. And for many years, I was a wannabe gardener, that big time. And look at this dirt. Embarrassingly, the biologist and her geologist husband did not dig into our dirt to look at what we had when we embarked on this garden project. <laughs> this, is, this kind of dirt is dashing my dreams, all right? This has sent me into, frankly, a panic attack. And my gut told me, you need to go get organic matter and you need to begin feeding the soil at the time I didn't really know all that much about soil life. But as time went on, and as we you know, dug deep into the research in the hidden half, I realized 
I'm not feeding the plants. I'm not even feeding the soil. I am feeding the organisms that are living in the soil that are at the root of everything. And so what I was doing was collecting organic matter, cheap. We'd blown, I wanted to spend money on plants, not on organic matter. And there's all of this stuff laying around my neighborhood in Seattle and in my neighbor's yards that they're not using. I collected that up. And I mixed mulches, and I layered it on top of the soil. And you heard Jean Paul this morning talk about um, the sort of growing direction that all farming needs to move, conventional and organic, toward low tillage or no tillage if we can get there, and toward regenerative methods. And I think this, I very much think this needs to hit the gardening world as well, because Think about that biological bazaar back to the root microbiome. If we were a root microbiome and somebody took the roof off of this building and stuck a plow in here or a shovel or a trowel and they start stirring, we are hitting the walls, we're hitting the ceiling, we're maimed, we're killed, we're injured. This is the problem with digging and this is the problem with tillage and why we need to get away from it. So the thing about uh, life it knows where the food is. The cows running to the pasture. Did anyone have to tell the cows where the pasture was? Do you need to tell the dog where the dinner is? So these meals of mulch, the microbes knew where that was. The macroforms, the earthworms, the beetles, the ones on the front end of deconstructing organic matter, they knew exactly where it was. I was not digging it in or tilling it in or amending my soil, so to speak. You put it out and they will come. And so all this talk of soil then, what is going on top of our soil? Here we go. These are my crops of maples. These are my crops of kale. Single crop, I guess I should say. But these are my crops of flowers. And there is not a lick of synthetic NPK that has hit this garden. That tells you what is possible, right? And that garden came from, these are Dave's hands, in his right hand there. This is the soil that we have today. The soil in his left hand is what we started with. The veg bed, because I'm, I'm layering organic matter into that, our carbon content there today is somewhere around 10 or 11%. And the perennial beds were up around 7 or 8%. And beneath our eco lawn is somewhere around 5 or 6%. Um, Jean-Paul also did those back of the envelope calculations. I would love to see those for gardens. There are more gardens than there are farms probably on this planet because they're postage stamp sized, but there's a lot of us and there's a lot of yards. So I'd like to see what can we do in terms of carbon sequestration um, along those lines. And so here is the importance of diet. Fertilizer diet will grow you biomass, but what is the quality? of that biomass. That's what we need to be thinking about. And I've been nattering here about the microbes. These microbial metabolites, when you are on a soil health diet, you're getting bucket loads of these metabolites because of the root system that is pushing out bucket loads of exudates. And a soil health diet, you get, those are adequate amounts of both your micronutrients and your macronutrients. And this is where I think we really need to be heading with things. Uh, OK, and so the takeaway here is really this. I think, I hope, that now you know what the connections are between soil health and your health. It all goes back to the root microbiome and the biological bazaar that is at the root of everything. And I am done. And I think at some point we're going to be able to feed our own microbiomes. So thank you for your attention. If you have questions, grab me later. Happy to answer them.